Okay, they're waiting right there. Don't you come up. Well, you know, having listened to this testimony today, it, it, the videotapes become even more important because they can put a lie to testimony. And what we have seen here on the part of this police officer is to try and create a very chaotic situation to try to suggest that the conduct that occurred, whatever it was, was justified because of the urgency of the circumstances. But if you look at the tapes, and you see when he himself, this officer, could not even identify where the chaos was. This classic defense were clenched. If you look at the tape, none of the men seated down at any point in time ever had clenched fists. None of the people in the videotapes even had clenched fists at all. And it's a classic police argument to suggest that people were combative and they have clenched fists. And that's stereotypic notions and to try to justify their, their conduct. That's number one. And so that's a real credibility question that is there and that at the end of the day, the tapes it's themselves will clearly demonstrate that there was nothing that Oscar Grant was doing that justified the use of deadly force number one or even the taser as a uh, defense. And so there was no basis for it. The earlier conversation uh, testimony about what happened, uh, the young lady testified, only corroborates much of what was on the tape. That there's no dispute that something's happening on the train. There's no dispute now, I would think, that Peroni is the one who went onto the train and grabbed the individuals. The most important thing that came from that, though, from the testimony this morning, other than the police officers, that there was no specific in the, in the information about anything that any of the young men had done. All we know is that the testimony is that one guy says they were, they were black. Well, there are a lot of black people on the train. And, and so there was no particularized specific information that Oscar, Michael, the Bryson brothers, any of them had engaged in any type of conduct. And so they were essentially stopped because they were young and African Americans for no other reason, because there was no facts to support that. It may be that ultimately it could have been determined, but at the time they were stopped and put in a particular location, there was no fact that the police officers had to indicate that any one of them had engaged in any unlawful activities. But aside from all of that, I think it's important to remember what the videotapes show. They don't show chaos on the part or threatening conduct on the part of the, police, of the individuals. You do see the young man talking, you hear them pleading their case, you see Oscar pleading his case, and you also see uh, Officer Peroni being very aggressive toward Oscar, very aggressive toward Michael, and you also see what you haven't, if you look at the tape, you see Messerly comes in on the right side, he does something to, uh, Mike, uh, to Jackie Bryson, and then he is the one that initiates the final contact with um, with Oscar when Oscar is against the, uh, against the platform that he and, uh, he and uh, uh, Peroni gauges that. So uh, putting aside everything else that goes on, the question here is, was there a factual basis to justify pulling Oscar away from the platform, putting him on his stomach, handcuffing him, but more importantly, using deadly force, and equally important was there a basis upon which to use a taser if that was going to be done. Keep in mind, at the time, Oscar was on his stomach. He had one officer on his left shoulder. He had another officer on his right uh, and his lower legs, and he had, there were other officers surrounding him. So in terms of containment, uh, it clearly had taken place. Number one, there was no evidence of any weapons of any kind. There was no knife. There was no gun. Oscar was not fighting. And none of the other officers were engaged in it. I'd only say in terms of evaluating the credibility of this particular officer, he talks at length about how chaotic he was, how scared he was. But, but what did he do that was suggest What's on the tape that supports that? He does not ever at any point in time uh, seek to get emergency relief. He does not appear to at any point in time to act 
act in a way that he felt that he had to bring his baton up and put it in a threatening position. He was unwilling to acknowledge that people were out there trying to videotape him, and he viewed that as a threatening way. So in terms of evaluating that testimony, what does it really offer? Other than trying to suggest that, that he was scared, whether he was or not, it doesn't appear that he was scared on the tape. It certainly doesn't appear that way. He certainly didn't act like a person who was scared. But putting that aside, the testimony itself does not undercut what we saw today that what's on the tape is the officer engaged in intentional act, that is measurably an intentional act when the person, when Oscar was down, he, he pulled out his gun, he stands up, and he shoots. What his reactions afterwards are, in terms of, and that doesn't appear to be any dispute that he made some kind of statement afterwards, like, um, oh my God, or words to that effect, that appears to have been stated. We have a number of people have said that. But the question is, does that undercut a criminal case that has taken place? Whether or not it was any justification for using deadly force or any degree of, of uh, physical force, uh, non-lethal or otherwise, and I think that the facts are so. Are you yes. are you saying then that the officer is lying under oath? This particular officer? Yeah. 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 I, I, when this officer, of course, I do not. I disbelieve the officer's testimony when he says he was scared to death. I disbelieve the officer when he says that the, the, that the people on the platform had clenched fists and the ones that were behind him clenched fists. There's no support for that. I disbelieve him when he says that he had to draw his weapon back and threaten it in an aggressive way. And in fact, his police report itself, where he has all these particular statements, are not supported by anything that's on the videotapes. I think there's one other point that's very, very critical here. <clears throat> he first tells us that he had a brief conversation with Meserly after the shot had occurred. But Meserly, they have eye contact and no statement was made. I would say to anyone that if Meserly had made a mistake, and the first thing he would have said to his partner is, I made a mistake, that I didn't intend to do it. We have no evidence from him at the first opportunity he had to tell his best friend that I had made a mistake and that I had intended to do something that. That speaks volumes in terms of what happened on that particular day. So all of it obviously has to be evaluated in its totality, but in terms of where we are today, the allegation that has been made and proven so far that uh, a, a, a murder has taken place, and the defense's job at this point is to try to undercut that to demonstrate that it's either less than murder, such as a manslaughter of some kind, or an accidental discharge. They have not done that, and they certainly didn't do it to, to this particular witness. We so he see, is however, one. We did see in the video at one point Oscar stand, yeah. stand up, and then the one woman uh, witness testified that, she, that he and others were mouthing off. And no, they were complaining, I, there's no doubt. They were complaining that they were being illegally detained, that there was no basis for, to arrest them, there was no basis to stop them. They were doing that. But that's not illegal. That one could, you can use profanity against a police officer as long as you do not prevent them from doing their job. There's no question that Oscar, when the, when the officer comes over to him before he gets me, he's, the officer rushes over to him and he has his hands up and he's getting up. That, that's not a threatening position at that moment. There was no effort, in my view, to communicate with him other than to use physical force. All of that has to be evaluated. But the question is, once you have done that, even if he gets up, even if he stands up, even if he says, mouth out, does that justify the kind of force that ultimately led to his death? And the answer to that is clearly no. 